It's oh. and we're live. Tada! Hello, shalom. Um, sure. I am Mimi, aka Melissa Thornley. If you're here, you know that my name is Melissa Thornley, but it, this is also Mimi's Global Cafe. So I am here as Mimi, and I am here with the one and only, the amazing Gabrielle Lyon, Executive Director of Illinois Humanities. Gabrielle, welcome to Mimi's Global Cafe. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, those of you, a lot of you can't see it, but especially at this time of year, because I'm a big SNL fan and I have this microphone that you can't really see, but sometimes I feel like I'm doing the sweaty balls thing, sweaty balls. Um, but I'm going to put this back down because I can't keep this bit going for the whole time, but I could if I wanted to. Let's talk about baking. <laughs> Let's talk about baking, Mimi. We can talk about baking. I, I have not experienced your baking skills. I have experienced your strawberry rhubarb jam, which oh, is yeah. my jam. It is to die for. It is I'm so a delicious. canner. I'm a canner. I don't know what to say. I I'm, is there a secret to it? Because I'm afraid to actually try it because I'm afraid I'm not going to do it correctly. And then I'm going to have all the, these people. spoiled goods. Right. Yeah, I could kill botulism. People. Botulism. botulism everywhere. Botulism uh, everywhere. The jam, you're going to be fine. You'll be fine. And it's not going to explode. That's like from the forties. So you don't have to worry about exploding jars and you're not going to kill anybody unless you start canning tomatoes. Then we're going to have to have a conversation. That's not going to happen because squirrels, I, I would I would have I would have so few tomatoes to can and I would just say these are the ones squirrels didn't get. Yeah. And that's about okay. it. And so, then you wouldn't want to eat them or give them away because they'd be so special. They'd be it's so like a museum object. The tomato that survived 2020. Oh my gosh, when I lived in Brooklyn, we had a garden and we and, and we also had a garden apartment. So we had this whole like plot of land, which was unheard of when you lived in Brooklyn Heights yeah. to have this much land. Yeah. So we planted this amazing garden, tons of tomatoes and the squirrels. I swear they were like New York badass mafia squirrels. And I had and, and they would take one bite out of the tomato and just let it drop like this is like the squirrels kind of giving you a screw you, screw you. Like, I, no, go ahead, try to try to grow these, try to grow these tomatoes. And at one point I had the window open and a squirrel saw me and started running right directly at me, right at the window. I barely got the window down before the squirrel would have jumped at me to like, yeah. like right out of yeah. National Lampoon's you know, Brooklyn. The Southeast side has squirrels like that. They're probably tougher than the ones in New York, let's be real. Uh, and here's what you need. You need a little electric fence. I'm An electric kidding. fence? Yeah, it's a little electric fence, a little zap on the nose, they never come back. Mr. McGregor's garden. When I lived in East Side, which is, you know, just east of the Skyway, 9700 yeah. South, I lived there for like a decade and I had a big garden. There might have been toxic waste in the soil just because, you know, it was right near the steel mill. So it's probably not the best earth. Uh, to plant in. But yeah, I got one of these little, and it's like a little electric wire. You put it around just one time. Doesn't really hurt them. Surprises them. They don't come back. Hmm. But if you have kids, it's probably not a good idea to get one of those. And and if we have if we have chihuahuas, the, the chihuahuas might not like the electric fence. Yeah, or just sleepy people. Sleep, sleepy people. That's right. I can, I can see myself like tripping over the electric fence and shocking myself. Not good. You don't want to can, but if you wanted to can, that's what you'd need. That would be, that would be it. That would be it. Okay. So let's, okay. I'm going to pick a topic. We have so many amazing topics here to talk about. Let's first, I, I want I want everybody to hear about Illinois humanities, because I know for myself, I would always sort of mix up Chicago humanities, Illinois humanities. I, I want you to tell us about the mission and the programming and what it's all about. Oh my God. Thank you for the softball. And I have to say, I've done a lot of different things in my life. When I got this gig as the executive director at Illinois Humanities, I was like, I'm at home. I really felt like all of the things I cared about came into alignment. Um, Illinois Humanities is one of 55 different humanities councils. Every state and territory has one. So when they established the National Endowment for the Humanities, actually the close to the year you and I also came into the world. Um, 
they were like, look, we have this federal agency, but really we care about money being organized locally. So we're going to set up state councils, they're nonprofits, and the whole mission is about making the humanities publicly accessible. So flash forward 40 plus years, Illinois Humanities, we're statewide, we're a nonprofit, and we do three things. Number one, and this is the longest part of our history, is we give grants. And the grants are to enable everyone everywhere in the state to have free access to the humanities. So we give grants for programming, for historic sites, for um, this year especially, and we have a whole conversation about this, COVID relief, because these are community organizations that um, preserve memory and history, archives, and uh, they're the collective soul of our state as we know it. So we give grants, we do free education programs, and um, I, you know, you're not supposed to have favorites, but I kind of have a favorite amongst our portfolio, and it's the Odyssey Project. Odyssey is an incredible program. It's going to celebrate its 20th anniversary, but Odyssey is an education program that gives college credit. So these are free classes for income eligible adults. And they take humanities classes with the freaking most badass, most amazing, creative, passionate teachers you could ever meet. So these are professors at all of the city's universities. They come together, they teach Odyssey. So we do grants, we do grants, we do education. And the last thing we do is public programs that are really about kind of getting disparate neighbors together, people who otherwise might not come together to explore really ideas and topics that matter using the humanities. Uh, I'll give you one little example of that. Uh, one is envisioning justice. We have a major initiative where we work with artists and humanists to use the humanities to help people imagine alternatives to mass incarceration. So these are big things that happen through conversations like the one you and I are having right now. How do you how do you change your idea about the world? How do you reflect on your own life, your own experiences? Illinois Humanities, I think at its heart, is really about protecting time and space for each of us to reflect on ourselves, on the world. And when we're at our best selves, we really collectively get to imagine what is the place and world we want to live in together. So. You know. That is awesome. Okay, we have, first of all, I have, we're going to pause for a second, okay. because all this, I forgot about the comments, and I wanted to tell everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, as we're going through, if you have comments, if you have questions, please go ahead and start asking them. Um, Erica is joining us. What? So is that, is, did I pronounce it right? It's Erica just spelled yes. a y r. Okay, awesome. Awesome, Erica. So happy that you are here. Mark Dunker, my man. I was not. Mimi was not alive in 1965. Mimi was born in 1971. That's right. Next year's the big 5-0. People, watch out. Um, and um, I can't re I Depending on when you put that up there, Erica, I'm not sure what the... Oh, it was probably the, the last topic that you mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is a question. So I'm going to actually post right here. I'm going to remind everybody please ask Gabrielle your questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because one of the things that occurs to me, and it, occur it occurs to me quite often actually, is that um, there's Chicago and then there's yeah. Illinois. So yeah. when I'm traveling, I people will ask me where I'm from. I would never say Illinois. Now I have some friends that live in other states. They're like, I am from the great state of Oklahoma and they claim their state. I claim Chicago because I feel like I'm a Chicago broad, and so I claim Chicago. Um, but with the pandemic this year and with so many of the programs going virtual, I'm wondering how much of the programming is really able to connect the the north half of yeah. the north part of Illinois with the south, southern half of Illinois. You really have so many interesting things. So just like a little PSA for Illinois, we're one of the top 10 most diverse states. There's 102 counties. Two thirds of the population live in the Chicago metropolitan area. So even though it would take you, if you and I got in the car right now together, which we would only do with our masks on and with the windows rolled open if we were, you know, it would take us eight hours maybe to drive to Cairo or to the southernmost areas of the state. 
two thirds of the population is concentrated in Chicago, but that's not really our history. So it's pretty normal for people to claim Chicago, even if you're not really from Chicago, Naperville people, you know, nothing against Naperville people because I represent the whole state, but seriously. So I think that um, the real question is how did we pivot? It was extraordinary. I think a big emphasis of our programs is the kind of trying to bridge the urban rural divide. So we have actually an entire program called the country and the city. We did a series focusing on three counties, Gallatin County, Fulton County and Cook County. And they're on, um, they're on YouTube. You can go watch them and get different stories and perspectives about these places. The extraordinary thing about the pandemic is because we're so committed to really thinking about what access look like looks like and because we were our team is extraordinary was really committed to not canceling any programs we had to do a 360 how do we be virtual we're deeply passionate about personally like highly personal conversations and creating space we had to let a lot of things go but the benefit is when we do a program now maybe 40 people are participating you know, if we were doing it in person, we might have a hundred people from all across the state participating. So the pandemic required a lot of organizations to pivot the way we did, but remote has had some benefits too, including bringing people together that otherwise might not have been together. Believe me, I would rather there was no pandemic, but um, we are definitely learning lessons about if you mostly care about making access, then you have to think about things like what you're doing right now, which is running some text on the screen in addition to the auditory experience. Um, so yeah, great state of Illinois. We have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of divisions, um, but there's a lot that makes us special. And if we can figure out some of these ways to repair civic fabric, to make room for discomfort, to make room actually for dialogue, if we can figure out how to do some things like that here, we can really be a leader for other states too. I have to, I'm going to put a pin in this. I know this is a public conversation, but this is a pin for a private conversation is there's this organization called Braver Angels. I don't yes. know. Okay. No, okay. 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 Yeah. So I, so I, I totally want to get, I want to be more involved with that and having those, creating those dialogues because I'm going to be honest. I am also like a guilty party when it comes to some of those conversations. You know, I want to, I, um, we were talking before we went live about the crown and oh, one yeah. of the things that I love about the crown is the queen and obviously it's Olivia Coleman's version of the queen, right? It's, we don't know that it's like really how the queen is, but just that notion of the queen being neutral and, and just, you know, doing the wave. I am not a neutral person. I'm not, I, I end up getting so excited and passionate about what I think about. And sometimes I have to be careful to be respectful of other people mm -hmm. at the same time as like being able to hold my own at the same time being able to allow space for other people, especially being kind of an extroverted type person is, is, is a thing for me. So learning how to do that and learning how to hold the space and create the space for that type of dialogue, because I just, people in humanity are wonderful and anyhow. So, well, you know, I, I think that it's hard to do without help. Honestly, like the more I have come to really appreciate and recognize, and it, I want to tell a story about Odyssey that's related to this, about the value of having protected time and space to be in a facilitated dialogue, right? So someone who might help say, okay, you know, Mimi, Melissa, where do you think, you know, what experiences did you have in your life? that brought you to have that opinion. So that we're focusing on the experiences that have shaped up mm -hmm. versus the opinion, right? So that's what a facilitator can do. The second thing that a facilitator can do is like, maybe you think you know your opinion and maybe you're very like ready to say what your opinion is, but the facilitator can also help you like wind down, hold it together for a second, maybe see something in a new way and you might see yourself in a new way. So that's like the facilitated dialogue part. The humanities part to me is also about using movies, text, music, which you, you know, I could just drink in your knowledge and understanding about music and the context and 
and you have a way of understanding music where it helps me, you, you interpret it for me. You help me know what to listen to and what those words mean. And that those musicians are maybe in a conversation with each other, for example, you know, you're a humanist, you are same thing with films, right? So, so the humanities also can give us a space, right? That's not neutral, but it gives us a, 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 an object like baby Yoda. No, not really like Baby Yoda. Maybe like Baby Yoda. To Yoda's in the house. Yoda's in the house. Yoda's in the house. This baby. Yoda. Every now and again, we can just you know shout out Yoda's in the house, and if somebody wants to throw in the comments, I Yoda like time. Baby Yoda, that's Lego. That's like this big. It's like a half Lego. Um, but my point is, here's what's great to me about the humanities. The humanities is the place that enables you to imagine alternative possibilities, even for your own experience, right? So, you know, maybe you're watching the queen and saying, hey, queen, how would I be a leader? <laughs> or maybe you're watching the queen and being like, hey, wonder how they got all that wealth. Was that because of a history that involved my people being oppressed you know maybe you watch the queen and you're super into the outfits or the music you know all that text all that fabric gives us a chance to like talk about something that also helps us think about our own stories and our own lives this is awesome because this the, the this segs into talking about ooh, erica has a very good question oh erica, I'm, let's I'm share on how does someone activate that space? Oh, yeah. So th that's actually the thing that I love about that question is that as Gabrielle was speaking, I there were two things that I ca that came up that I came up with. One is you can't I, I don't feel you can be the person and the facilitator at the same time. Like you're not in the dialogue and a facilitator at the same time. So if you want to facilitate and create a space for the discussion, then you are in a facilitator's role. If you are working through the content yourself and working through the thoughts and the ideas and the conflict yourself, then you best not, it's almost like if you're in a courtroom, you've got the judge and then you've got the two lawyers and then you've got the two, you know, the, 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 the two people that are in the struggle, right? Like, so you can pick and then you, there's a jury, right? There are all these different roles that are being played. I don't know. I mean, I think that is definitely one model. That is definitely one model. And at a time when dialogue isn't a skill we get to practice, that's oh, where exactly. having, so like, just to like, to maybe take this a step further, right? We talk about how hard it is to have a conversation, being conflict averse, all of which is exacerbated by the ways in which we're segregated. We're segregated by our economies, right? So if I'm more well off, I tend to live in places where there are less people who are not as financially well off, vice versa. Racially, we're segregated, right? So there's a lot of ways in which we tend to increasingly know people who are like us. So that also makes it, takes the burden of us burden of the skill development off of us. So I think having a facilitator, having protected time and space, using the humanities as a way to open a conversation is great. But I love to imagine an, a world in which the humanities is central to how we do everything, that you can't have an infrastructure project to build new viaducts without also making room for talking about memory and meaning and, and maybe what kind of monuments are happening by erecting that viaduct, you know, like that kind of thing. But also your depiction of like, either you're the facilitator or you're the participant. I have a belief that when you get to practice really listening and reflecting you then don't need a facilitator as much as we're all starting to be more practiced in, I don't know, there's both civil dialogue, absent from, like, we don't have a lot of models, we don't have a lot of experiences, and there's also civic dialogue, which is where all of us maybe are having this conversation, and Mark and Erica, we're all having a conversation, and we're also having a conversation about decisions that affect the community or how money is spent or what kind of quiet time there is in our apartment building or that kind of thing. You know, really participatory civic experiences that are both civil but civic. Purposeful. I love that. 
I love that. My friend Ellen published a book this, was it this year? Actually, it might have come out last year called The Civility Project. And it's all about civility and creating civility in space, um, which, which makes me excited. I agree with you in many, there, like the, the thing that pops up into my head is, okay, marriage counseling. You know, yeah. you're there and, and and you've got like your therapist and then you've got the two, you know, the two parties or like, I, you know, I was talking about having a judge and all that. But there are times like, how there are spaces that are created for facilitation mm -hmm. and for healing and for understanding. Yeah. Right. And so and some of them are more formal. But then yeah. where can we create informal opportunities for that? space to be there. So in a dialogue with your cousins or with a family member or with a friend that you says something that kind of triggers you, like what th those types yeah. of things, like how to, um, so, how to create that informal space. I, I, and you know, I'm kind of thinking about back to the kind of the origin question, right? That kicked this part of the conversation off with Erica. So a couple of things. Number one, Illinois Humanities quarterly offers free facilitation training. It's free and it's for anybody that works at a nonprofit organization. And if you mention the Mimi Cafe, we could probably get you in. <laughs> um, uh, but the facilitation training is really to do what, what you're saying, which is how do you develop some comfort and fluency with how to open or open a conversation, enter a conversation, maybe re uh refocus the conversation that's one thing the second thing is it's so funny i meant to bring it with me uh down here to the basement where i'm broadcasting from um there's a great little beautiful beautiful book that's called like the little book on like having hard conversations or something like that and it comes out of a practice of faith leaders who really are interested in fostering like intercultural dialogue and they have all these examples. So this first is you can get training, you can read about it, but also just going to things and experiencing it, that is like the most important thing. And I think for Illinois Humanities, the, the things that have been most striking to me. So I've been on the job about a year and a half, almost two years and well, I guess a year and a half because it'll be two years in June. It's been a very long year. Um, <clears throat> is the way in which people who have the opportunity to be in conversation, whether it's through the Odyssey project, that's really like a course, or they come to something like country and city, which is maybe an event, they really do leave more open, more interested. It's like their awareness has been heightened about the mm -hmm. possibilities. And I think that if you go if you read anyone who's really interested in what it means to create a public, John Dewey is kind of my go-to. That's my key reference among, among others. Um, experience really matters. So like back to how does someone activate the space? The first is like a library, your Starbucks. You know, one of the great travesties, I think of our moment leading into the pandemic, who knows how exactly we'll come out of the pandemic, but leading into the pandemic, the increasing privatization of spaces as luxury, as um, amenities. So for example, so many buildings in Chicago being built with a pool, essentially a private park, outdoor spaces that then keep you from going to the Washington Park pool. I'm down here on, you know, 55th and, and King Drive or the public park. They're not sitting outside eating their lunch because their building has their like indoor private amenity. I think that's a real misplacement of those dollars in terms of the kinds of things you're talking about and Erica's talking about, which is how do you activate the space? The first thing is to value it. Yeah. Is to value it. It's interesting because it, on first blush, like at first blush, you wouldn't necessarily think you think, oh, well, that's so cool. My, my building has a rooftop pool. Right. And then I stop and I think about all the summers I went to Hinkley Pool in Park Ridge and and hung out there or went to Oakton Pool, whatever the pools were. Right. You know, and, and then you encountered other people. So that's I'm so sorry. This is so rude. I'm texting my mom 
because I told her I was going to call her. I just had to tell her. Sorry, that's so rude. Oh, no, I'm, that's okay. Especially right. with your mother. Yeah. Like my mom is probably watching. And if she's not, mom, shame on you. But um, my mom is probably watching because, you know, I, I sent an email yeah. to our, our moms love us, right? Our moms totally love us. What's not to, I mean, we love our moms. Mm -hmm. Our mom, like I, in, in my, um, and we'll segue over into um, word count and reading and libraries yeah. and all of that. But my mom taught me to read at a really early age. Mm -hmm. So I just, I love, love reading and I love libraries. Like the first thing that I ever do right. when I move into a new city is I'm like, I got to get a library card. And, um, and to the point where like when I lived in New York, the only mm -hmm. way you could get a library card in New York was to have a New York driver's license. So I had to give up. Oh, yeah. and, and I wasn't driving in New York. Nobody, I never I drove. I lived anywhere. in New York for two years. I never drove once in nor around well, in New York. No. Where's a shout there. out for Libby? If everybody Libby. doesn't know, you can read library books, magazines, movies. A friend of mine just told me she gets the Wall Street Journal. She signed up. Uh, I have done a huge amount of reading. I'm a huge fan of the public library. Um, as a working mom, it's been hard to get there. Libby has transformed my life. I've read some of my most favorite books this year via Libby. Thank you very much. And as we get up for word count, which is the readathon event of the year for Illinois Humanities, um, I encourage you first and foremost to like check out your public library via Libby, right? you know, on your device, uh, go to your independent bookstores and I'm happy to send a link um, or, you know, read a book that you love, reread it. You already have it sitting next to it. Reread it. Um, oh, this, so this was uh, talking about reading in libraries. So this was, I, I said, I was going to do a little. Oh, your mom's here. Oh, your my mom is here. Me. Okay. Let's see here. Let's see. I'm here. That's awesome. Okay, so that's a picture of my mom with a martini. My mom is not like a massive drinker, but she, the, I've got the, the one picture that I have of her drinking a martini, um, and it's a pink martini, is her is her profile picture. Go mom. That's so cute. Okay, so my mom is going to actually love this. Okay, here we go. I'm going to share this screen. Watch out world. Watch out world. Um, do no, 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 no. Okay, it should share. Okay, can you see it? Can you, I don't know that. Okay. So can you see the arrow or can you just see the picture? I can only see the picture. Okay. So anyhow, the girl on the right, Stop. that would be me. Stop. And um, so one summer I volunteered at the library, the Park Ridge Public Library. And so, because I don't really, I, I love summer, but I don't really like the sun. And so rather than be outside playing, I was like, I'm going to shelve books and um, restock books. So that's great. I, um, <laughs> I lived in the library in Bogota, New Jersey. It was the best place ever. Loved that library. Loved it. It's so much. Libraries are the best. They are the best. And um, yeah. So, but speaking of libraries, one of the main reasons why we are here is to talk about word count. Yeah. And the thing that I love about word count is the first thing that I thought of was in the summer, in addition to me being a dork and working at the library during the summer, I, um, I loved the summer reading contests where you would go into the library and you would get a little game board and then they would stamp you and you had to read they they probably did the same thing for you like they made you read all kinds of books like you had to read yeah. different I, I, genres right different genres. Oh, had biography to, i had to read a book about sports i was like who wants to read about sports i mean now there would probably be something interesting but at the time i'm like i'll just read about hey okay. hey it's my mom Whoop. Gabe. Hey. hey hey mom, mom Gabe. i'm gonna interview right now i know i thought you just called me no, I didn't call you. I'm going to I'm going to call you right when I'm done. Bye. Bye. Now she's in Arizona? New, New Mexico. Mexico. Okay, New Mexico. Um yeah, the so word count. All right, so a couple of things. First of all, I want to be serious and then I'm going to tell the fun part. Okay, the serious first. thing. All right, so here's the first part about the serious thing. Well, I'm going to tell the very first thing is the following. Part of me, so I came up with the idea in part because all of the virtual 5Ks were just annoying the bejesus out of me. 
I don't know. Are we, are we allowed to curse on this show? Um, you can't. I don't think Facebook is going to yeah. screw you up or anything. So go for it. It's I'm probably, probably not appropriate for my dignified role. Um, <laughs> in any case, all these virtual 5Ks, all these nonprofits were running virtual 5Ks. And I was like, that's great. That's great. You know, and at the same time, I really like fundraising that is like super aligned to mission. That's just kind of how I'm built. So I was kind of like, why can't there be a competitive humanities event? So that I was just kind of chewing on that. So, so that's the first piece was really, it's just an intervention against running in the winter. <laughs> okay. But you should be okay. healthy. Everybody should run because it's good for you. The second thing though, which is, I think actually the serious part of the conversation is really like using the excuse of word count to read. I, if even one person is like, you know what? I said I was going to read a book for word count. I'm going to read it. And being intentional about making some time and space for yourself to read whatever that is, you know, Dune, sci-fi, Octavia Butler, speculative fiction, which is like, I finally found a word for my favorite kind of reading that was through Illinois Humanities. I never knew what to call it. Um, history, you know, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich has some relevance to us right now, <laughs> you know, but if, if all, that would be a lot to read in a month, but seriously making time and space to honor the pleasure of reading and for those of us that might be need a little purpose that but the best part of word count is you can sign up and just read and win extraordinary prizes you can share on social media and i think the hashtag is in the chat but i think i didn't put it in the comments in the right way but it's hashtag il word count so illinois word count and you can share you can also fundraise and every single dollar we raise is going to go directly to the Odyssey Project. And so the Odyssey Project, again, is this um, free humanities courses, uh, income eligible adults can participate. We have five sites. One is completely in Spanish. You earn credit at UIC. And I am so jealous of every single moment that these people are in class um, because they read great things. They have these incredible conversations. They're sharing their life stories. And it really changes your understanding of whether you're looking at art history or photography or theater or literature. It's just a very a philosophy. Um, so all the money that's raised is raised for the Odyssey Project. Um, so word count, super fun. It runs through July, through through July, through January 25th. We've never done it before, right? We've never done it before. So uh, sign up. Let me know how it goes. If you sign up and mention that you heard about it from Mimi's Cafe. Or, or Melissa. Yeah, just Mimi's. Or, and you can, I it, for those of you who are actually friends with me on my other yep. page, and I'll post it here too. I've got a page. So if you want to just go and check out my page, I've got a page there. Um, and, but sign up, share about it. Gabrielle, what are you reading right now? What's the book? Okay. That so what am I reading right now? I am reading three books at the same time. Yeah. There is one book that I am going to do a shout out for though, because I just bought it um, and cracked it. I bought it at the Silver Room, which is a very awesome shop here in Hyde Park. So I'm reading, can you see this? Is it back? Just, yeah, Just Us, Claudia. Just us. And the thing I love about this is, I mean, it's really about these like episodes and vignettes of people having conversations about whiteness. And so that is something that's relevant. You know, I am a white woman leading a nonprofit organization that is deeply committed and concerned to things like racial equity, trying to have a better understanding of how we can be more of an anti-racist organization. So, so the subject matter is interesting, but I'm also trained as a historian and a documentarian. And I also love it because it's like, snippets of conversation she's overheard, excerpts of essays, her own like diaries. And so it's also just really fascinating as a pastiche of um, ways of, of capturing narrative. So I love that. Um, I'm reading The Long Haul, which is, uh, I'm an educator. So really I was trained as a historian, but really I'm a teacher. And um, Miles uh, Horton, uh, it's his it's his biography and I've never read it and it's 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 autobiography so the long haul is another one but I read a lot of cookbooks so I don't I, I think that counts too because I like to bake so 
there's at, at the Norwood, uh, at the, um, at our library here in Norwood Park, pre-pandemic, th their book club, they have a cookbook book club and everybody gets the cookbook and then you Stop check it. it out. Yeah. Oh my God. I love it. Yeah. We can apply for a grant to Illinois Humanities. That's, that's, that's a really good We have activation grants and um, they're like $500 and it lets you take a collection and activate it. I'm not kidding. That's like a real grant, $500. That's I don't, I don't read, I don't read or review any of the grants. So I am not a decision maker. Just to be clear, you can't be like, oh, I heard about it on Mimi's Cafe. Can I automatically have the grant? No, no. You still have to apply. doesn't work for grants. Doesn't work for yeah. grants. I'm reading um, Lillian Box Fish Takes a Walk, which is so delightful. Oh it's so you delightful. You are a lover of reading. It, yeah, I, I just, yeah, I just love, I just love reading. And I, and I also am not the best at just carving out space, like you said, and giving yourself permission to just say, like, um, sorry, in the middle of the book right here, like, talk to the hand, like, talk to the hand. And that's what I want to be able to do. And um, and the thing that's been so great about this time, this is for book club. This is for, um, I'm in the St. Luke's Page Turners, Park Ridge, Illinois. Thank you very much. Shout out to St. Luke's. And, uh, and so that is not Chicago. Sorry, go ahead. It's, you know, it's where I grew up. So it's just kind of funny. And, um, but then I ended up um, messaging with the author, Kathleen Rooney is a professor at, um, she's a writer and a professor at, at um, DePaul. She lives in Chicago and she's amazing. And then I ended up going up and getting, going and getting her new book. And oh. I got her new book at um, Women and Children First, which I is my favorite bookstore. Yeah, it's my favorite bookstore. I used to live in Andersonville and it's still my favorite bookstore, regardless of the fact that I don't live there anymore. Favorite bookstore. So shout out to Women and Children First. Yeah. And um, yeah, but reading and just loving it because then it opens your eyes to so much that you could not open your eyes to otherwise. You know, this thing that you mentioned about kind of the excuse to protect space for yourself. Like, I don't want to, um, I don't want to gloss over that because one, I do actually kind of feel there for some of us, we, we kind of need a little help making an excuse for ourselves. We're not maybe so good at it. So great. If word count gives you an excuse to read great. But the other thing is the, the humanities is like critical for us to be able to be more human and more humane. And so, so many of us are turning to like television and movies and, and to help us feel less, less isolated, whether they're on YouTube, right. Or Instagram or on Netflix or on, you know, channel five, whatever all the places, all, all the, the places. places, all the places. Um, but when the pandemic, I want to, I just want to tell this story about when the pandemic hit. So Illinois humanities, you know, we're a, we're a small-ish, small to mid-sized nonprofit. I have a team of 16 incredible, incredible people. Um, and when the pandemic hit, you know, we went remote, like Jan like March 11th, we were in the office. And the next day, like we weren't, you know, so like everybody else, but all of our programs are about bringing people together. And Odyssey was in the middle of their semester. And the team that ran Odyssey was like, you know, what are we going to do? We'll check in with the faculty. We'll check in with the students and like try to figure out how are we like, are we just going to end? Like, how are we going to do this? There's supposed to be another couple classes. And the students in Odyssey came back and 201 were like, yeah, all hell is breaking loose. We may be losing our jobs. We may have no child care because now the kids are in the house and they're not right. All of those things going on, right? They really, really wanted to keep the Odyssey classes going. And to me, in my position where I had to figure out what was the charge to our team? What is the mandate to Illinois Humanities in this, in this moment? You know, do we hunker down? Do I just take care of my staff? What is it we do? That response helped me help our organization be our best selves. Because if that's was so valuable and so important. Like we're talking about like talk to the hand, right? And you and I both, you know, have the luxury of like, I've got a quiet place to read if I want to, right? So it's hard. That really made the charge to our organization to be our best selves. And we immediately moved money to give COVID-19 relief grants, just general operating grants out the door. We committed to not canceling any programs, 
And then we really tried to, like, we did a lot of things that were just like, we have to figure out how to do this. Okay, we're not paying for, you know, all of these things. Can we get like, internet for people? Can we get Zoom licenses for people? Can we um, do a Zoom training, a virtual training? We have a great program called Road Scholars. So if you have a senior home or a uh, veteran center or a library, you can bring in a world-class humanist, a musician, a, a, a writer, a poet, performing artist, and we underwrite their ability to kind of come in and deliver programs. We actually help that community get together and do peer to peer training on how to do virtual performances. So I bring this all back to word count because it can just be a readathon. It can be the exact excuse you want to read that one book that you've really wanted to read. But at the heart of it for me is Odyssey students, uh, have a drive and appetite for the humanities that I aspire to have. So it's also a fundraiser. Yeah, it's well, and it's, and it all is to your point, it is all aligned. Like the, 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 the passions, the love, it flows seamlessly to in, into each other. And it also, the way you speak about it, you know, one of the, one of the topics that I threw out there is like education is activism because it's it and in the truest form of activism in a way because it's activating us right when we learn about something we become we understand it and then we become activated as humans and then we can interact differently yeah. with other people i've always thought of these two things as you know deeply intertwined uh howard zinn who's very well known for for his history book, A People's History of the United States, also wrote a book called You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. And we are in a moment in which the onus is on each of us to understand our context. And we may not have needed to, we may have been able to, again, run a nonprofit without uh, understanding the ways in which like, we've maybe been privileged with our education or our social network to make it not unlikely that we could get hired in whatever our jobs are if we're white or if we're of a certain socioeconomic class, mostly if you're white. Um, but the reality is everything is political. There is no such thing as neutrality. And so um, the value I think of education and what the humanities really brings in a unique way, you know, I spent 20 plus years as an activist for science education to make science accessible to the least likely kinds of young people to have access to really transformative experiences with science. But the, the thing about the humanities is that it uniquely, gently, powerfully opens up the opportunity for you to talk about those things that make us human and make yes. meaning of our lives and our experiences. So how is that not activism? I don't know. It's about right. No, it's one hundred percent activism, and 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 in the best way possible, right? In a very like pure, spiritual, holistic, educational, like the whole thing, the whole, yeah. the whole shebang. Gut wrenching. The whole what? Gut wrenching at times. Gut wrenching at times for sure. Yeah. Okay, so I know you, but we're new friends, right? Yeah. From this year, we're new friends. So of course I Googled you. I was Googling the crap out of you before we were getting on here. And I noticed something. Well, first, this is how it first came up. I'm going to switch up my banners here. First, it came up that you were Chicagoan of the year. Chicago Magazine named you a Chicagoan of the year, which seems to me to be like an a massive honor. And so then I, when I read the article about you in Chicagoan of the year, I'm like, wait a minute. She's just not just a Chicagoan of the year. She, she she won a presidential award for science mentoring. And I'm like, and I said, wait a minute, presidential, hmm, 2000. I'm like, she must have met President Obama. And then I find out that yes, it's true, you did. And so I would like to hear about. We want to talk about project exploration, and I want to hear about that. And I also want you to tell us right now about President Obama. Because, you know. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to tell you a little story about getting this presidential award for science wow. mentoring. Okay, so Project Exploration, we're going to talk about that. But long story short, the organization won an award for leveling the playing field for science for um, 
underrepresented youth, minority youth. So kids who are black, girls, primarily on the south side of Chicago when I was running the organization. Um, all right, so they bring, so there's like a dozen of us and most of the people winning the awards are not from a nonprofit organization. They're professors who are helping enable doctorates. So PhD students in mathematics and science and engineering where there are very, very few people of color. I mean, you can count on two hands the number of black mathematicians with doctorates and the number who are in geology or less. And I mean, these are pathetically, outrageously small numbers. Anyway, so they're like, okay, woo, woo, get all together. We're going to have you stand. Everybody's going to get seated. The president's going to come in, leave all your cameras and your phones and all that. You can't bring anything in. Okay. But here's the thing. Of course I brought my camera in because I'm no fool. Right. So I like slip my camera in. Well, you can't see, but I like slipped it into like the band of my pants and I was pregnant. So it's kind of like, this. guys, did you get pregnant just so you could hide your phone? You got pregnant just so you could hide your phone when you, yeah, let's not tell my kids. They think I like them. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so the president comes in and I'm like trying to like get us like a picture and he recognizes me because I lived in Hyde Park and I, and, and he and Michelle, Men mentored me. Michelle Obama, like, okay, whatever, President Obama, Michelle is, she she's a shit. She mentored many, many people my age, older than me, younger than me, to really create fabulous nonprofits all over the city. Project Exploration is just one. So anyway, he's like, Gabe, how are you? It's great to see you. Gives me a big hug. Kiss me on the cheek. It's right here. I haven't washed it. Can you see? It's like a little bit dirty still because I haven't washed it for like a bazillion years. Anyway, so meanwhile, all the other awardees, their mouths fall open and they're like, you know, President Obama? And I was like, well, I wasn't going to like lord it around like, oh, me and Barack, man, we've been having dinner together, you know, back when he was a senator. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so that was really fun. And then it was really fun seeing everybody else's faces. So anyway, yeah, that was fun. And I have pictures that I, cause I snuck in my camera, of course. And like, it's like really awkward. Like you see like the side of his face. Cause I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> that is photographer, worst photographer in the family. Yeah. But you don't have to be a great photographer to get, I mean, it's just, I really fun. Oh. But I love that picture. I actually feel like here's, I'm, um, you I know, need to see that picture. Thing, yeah. The best thing about that award was not this scene I just described. The best thing about that award was when I got back, I went to Kinko's and made color copies of that award and mailed it to every single one of the 308 students in Project Exploration. Because can you imagine, here's a president of the United States. He's the first black president He's standing at the podium, he's giving a national award, and he names Project Exploration and the young people by name, not all 308, but he says, you know, and these young people of Project Exploration, and it was like my feet couldn't touch the ground. I didn't feel the ground. And that meant so much. So really the best thing about that experience was like coming home, getting everyone a certificate, you know, telling them this story and having them know that they, they really change the idea of what's possible about who should be involved in science. I love everything about that. Yeah. I love everything about that. And then, it, and then it just, it, 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 make, it, it, it makes like such a nice form, gives me nice form fuzzies. And speaking of pivots, by the way, the executive director of Project Exploration, you should interview her. Her name is Natasha Walker. They're in, they're based in Austin now. When COVID happened, that lady found a van and they moved from doing after school programs on site to dropping off science kits at kids' houses and running science activities via Zoom. Oh my God, I love it's that. Highly personalized. So anyway, you know, this this pandemic has made all of us try to find ways to be more human, especially in the absence of other kinds of leadership. This is where you see civic leadership. This is where you see what it means to be a community and a society. It's how we treat each other and take care of each other. It is. It is. Moment for that. A moment for that. Okay. 
I'm going to segue into this one. A dinosaur in the Sahara. Oh, you are really going back. I have got to. Yeah, but you cannot just throw out, oh, I found a dinosaur in the Sahara. It's like it should be a police song or something. It's tea in the Sahara. But I would much rather find a dinosaur in the Sahara than have. Well, yeah. you probably had tea in the Sahara after you found yes. the dinosaur. Yeah. Tea in the Sahara is a big thing, especially in Morocco. Yeah, mint tea. Oh my gosh, it's so good. Algeria, Morocco. That is a very serious, yes, tea. Three okay, cups of tea. Talk to us about this dinosaur. Uh, okay. So I was part of a team. Well, my ex-husband is a paleontologist at the University of Chicago. Uh, we won't mention his name. We don't need to do that. You can Google him and find him. He's very famous. Um, but, you know, I was actually invited on the first expedition I went on because I was a writer and an educator and they were interested in having a non-science person kind of tell stories from the field. Um, so I didn't come up through science. I came up through history and writing and all that stuff. So, all right. So the hardest expedition to me was 1995. We were in Morocco. We were doing a lot of work and finding a lot of nothing. And uh, I won't get into all of the details because you can watch it in National Geographic, but I did find a dinosaur, a very beautiful dinosaur. It's about 36 feet long. It's very svelte. And we named it uh, Delta Dromius Agilis, which is the river runner, the agile river runner. And they even made a little toy out of it. Super cute. I We need to see what this is and post it oh, in the comments. Here's place else. If you're in Chicago, you can go to the Chicago Children's Museum and you can see Suchomimus. So Suchomimus is the crocodile mimic. I helped dig up and also name that dinosaur. And I uh, was part of the design team that designed that exhibit uh, at the Chicago Children's Museum. So you can go see one of the dinosaurs. Oh, cool. that's awesome. And yeah. that's at the one, is that the one in Navy Pier? Yeah, at Navy Pier. Awesome. Whoa. Okay. Here, Global Cafe, I'm going to bring dinosaurs and libraries together. Are you ready? I'm ready. Blow okay. my mind. First dinosaur I ever participated in digging up was the first predatory dinosaur ever discovered in Africa. We named it, we named it Afrovenator, the African hunter. And when it came time to unveil it to the public, so there's a theme for me, right? Public, public, public. So we unveil this dinosaur at National Geographic. It's really exciting. It's the first African predatory dinosaur. It's a very, very big deal, um, you know, because you hear about T-Rex and all these things, but this is an African predator. Where are we going to put it? And I say, why don't we put it at, wait for it, the Chicago Public Library. Yes, Siri, Bob, the world premiere of Access to the Africa's first predatory dinosaur was actually at the Harold Washington Public Library. Oh my God, I love that. You didn't see this story coming together, did you? I did not. I, and this is what happens. This is like, I feel like we're kind of Malcolm Gladwelling this whole situation because that's how Malcolm Gladwell would do it on Revisionist sure. History. Although he would have, you know, scripted it out and, like, and yeah. he would have had editors. We're doing this without editing. I know, because we're women. We're women, we can do that. We that's just, that. We, that, that's just, you know, we can bake, we can find dinosaurs, and, you know, we can also write graphic novels, can't we? Bet you didn't see that one coming. I didn't. Wow, you were doing it all. Right, this got way more. Okay. Oh my God, this is my favorite project. Can I go grab one and show it to you? Yeah, 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 grab one. Beautiful. And while you're out, I'll just bring out some toys. Hi, this is Yoda. And then this is Willow. And I don't think Willow from Buffy has ever met Yoda from Star Wars or The Empire Strikes Back, let's be honest. But so Willow is meeting Yoda. And here we are, and they're talking, and we're waiting for Gabrielle to come back. Okay, okay. I'm back, I'm back. All right. Okay. So, first of all, I'm a big fan of graphic novels, you know, and back to like text and narrative. You know, graphic novels can be Wonder Woman, mm -hmm. and it could be Justin Sandman. Sandman, Watchmen. It can also be Mouse, M-A-U-S, which is about the Holocaust by Art Spiegelman, right? So I'm a big fan of graphic novels because they really are mass education. It's really accessible. So when I was at the Chicago Architecture Center, um, where I was the vice president for education for about four years, um, the 50th anniversary came up and uh, the CEO was like, okay, vice presidents, come in with your ideas for what we should do for our 50th. And I said, there was a kid's version 
of the plan of Chicago, the 1909 plan of Chicago, which is part of why we have like upper and lower Wacker drive. And we have the Emerald necklace of all the boulevards and parks that circle the city and all those things. But there was a kid's version and I was very enamored of this kid's version called Wacker's manual because the introduction is it's only through our united civic virtue that our city will be great. Imagine if every single kid in the city of Chicago were taught as a requirement that is only through their united civic efforts that the city will be what we want. So make a long story short, I was like, what if we reinvent Wacker's manual, this kind of snoozy textbook, um, in the 21st century, it would be a graphic novel. And instead of being a textbook, why don't we make it focused on the adventures of young people in the past, the present, and the future. And so the result was this graphic novel called No Small Plans. <gasps> it is set in the past, present, and future. Um, all real places, there's an annotated guide. You know, I'm a super nerd. So I worked with, I want you to see their names because, whoops, sorry. So Devin oh. Maudley, can you read it? Yep, Devin, yep. Devin Maudsley, Casey Bayer, Chris Lynn, and Dion Reed. They were commissioned by the Chicago Architecture Center to be the artists and graphic designers. And the four of us worked together over about six months to, to create this novel. And like, you know, I, oh, you can amazing. Every place is real, the palettes change. I mean, I could talk about this for hours, but the main thing is the Kickstarter was launched. You can go see it. It's just a Kickstarter backslash no small plans. We raised enough money to distribute, I think it was something like 5,000 copies for free. And now, I don't know if they're still doing it this way, but the idea was every time someone would buy a copy, they would give a copy away to schools. And we just, and when I left the organization, No Small Plans was being used as curriculum in 120 classrooms. And then Washington by and by, the state uh, of Washington yeah. reached out and wanted to do a graphic novel centered on housing. And so Kevin, uh, Casey, Devin, and I teamed up again, ran another Kickstarter, but we focused on, it's all about young people in urban planning and designing places that they want, need, and deserve. Washington by and by is free. You can just download it online. You can just do it right now. Washington by and by. So, it's just, again, it's just back to like, how do we have conversations? What are the catalysts for conversation? So I'm very privileged to have worked. Like, I don't know what it's like to be in a band, but I think like if a band is really awesome together, that's what it's like when me and Devin and Casey get to work together. We're like a band, I think. Well, it sounds like there is going to be a time to get the band back together. Oh man. Yeah. I would love to get the band, band, band together. back together. Yeah. yeah get the band back together. And, and and so one of the things that I do want to do is yeah. is is tie it back. We're, okay. we're getting close to the hour. So I want to tie it back into what brought us here in the first place, which is word count. Our reading competition slash impetus and fundraiser for the Odyssey Project. Right. So that is that is one of our big goals here is to get everybody excited. All right. I'm ready. Special prizes, special, special prizes, prizes for mentioning all over them. Illinois, coffee, chocolate, games, crafts, Illinois only. Anybody who gives or raises $25 is going to get an amazing, it's going to be a collector's item. Uh, I upped my word count with Illinois Humanities sticker. I mean, how, how can you not want that? But here's the thing. You probably wanted to read anyway, right? Yeah. Wanted to read anyway. So this is just an excuse to be part of a community of readers all over the state, maybe all over the country, all over the world, if you spread the word. And if nothing else, you're part of a community of readers. You definitely can win a prize. And if you decide you want to fundraise, those dollars go right from word count into the Odyssey project to fund things like books and uh, material supplies, sometimes food cards. Some of our folks could use some support. Odyssey project, first and foremost, is where we want this to, to go. 
But I think the best thing is, you know, uh, Melissa, I think me and you could go head to head, see who reads more, see who raises more. Um, they could support you. They could support me. Like, if you don't want to do any of that Are stuff. Are you challenging me to a showdown? Maybe. I think I, I think I, I, that, think I would like a showdown. I think you just challenged me to a showdown. Maybe. Now and I'm going to bring out Yoda. Oh. And, and Willow. I, I'm, 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 I'm Yoda and Willow. And. I'm bringing in Bowie, right? Like all the toys are coming out now, Gabe, because like if if you're challenging me to a showdown, I'm bringing Buffy and Willow. I'm bringing you. Oh, I mean, I don't really want to go up against Buffy, but Voltron's here. Oh my gosh, that is pretty awesome. Voltron's here. Voltron turns into cats too. Okay. Um, I think I'm allergic to cats. So I don't in a that. time of, I, you know, Melissa, I'm just thinking about our context of our moment. Yes. And I'm so grateful that you invited me to spread the word about Illinois humanities and word count because there's nothing like the humanities to bring us together. And rather than challenge you head to head, I think we should unite forces and come up with a shared goal. What do you think? Oh, that's not a bad idea. Yeah. That's not a bad idea. Maybe we can challenge each other to be we'll challenge master. each other. We call this collaboration, collaboration, or yeah. or compa compa collaboration. Compa. There's a word for it. Yeah. There's a word for it. Okay. But, you know, I'm I'm good with the competitive humanities, but I think we're both doing it for the right reason. We're aligned. We're our aligned. Goals, in our yeah, so here's the deal: we have aligned goals. Yeah. And we're but competing I'm for a common good. I'm right. We're not competing more against you or raise more money than you. Yeah. One of those two things. Yeah. That's and, what I'm gonna do. And, and we're gonna end this on a fun, we're gonna end this on a fun okay. note. This whole right. thing has been super fun. But I, I thought, okay, I'm gonna do one of these speed round things. Everybody does these speed rounds. I've never done that before. I'm gonna do a speed round. Okay. I came up with these right before. Well, I'm nervous. Okay. I'm nervous. Okay. 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 So question number one. Yeah. What is the class you wish you took in college? I took in college. Oh, I wish I had been able to like dissect things. So I guess, oh, college, college class. Uh, 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 Shakespeare, Shakespeare plays. A Shakespeare play class. Shakespeare okay. Plays. Very good, very good. okay. So this will help with your dissection possibly. Okay. What is the club you wish you had joined in high school? Theater. The theater club. Of course, you're very dramatic. Very dramatic. Okay, what's the concert you wish you were going to tonight? Any concert? What what concert? Could, if you could go to any concert in the world, it doesn't have to. The band doesn't even have to be together anymore. What concert would you go to get go to tonight? Ten Thousand Maniacs. Okay, you got it. Okay, That's a band. It is a band. <laughs> Your favorite poet. Favorite poet. Oh, I do have a new, I have a new favorite poet. My current favorite poet is um, Audre Lorde. Is she a poet? Yeah, I would call her a poet. I, well, I was going to say also Walt Whitman I'm reading. I don't know. I'm new to poetry. Those are both good answers. Solid answer. Okay. Yeah. Um, the next movie you would like to see in a theater. Oh, hands down, Fast and Furious. Awesome. That was really easy. You yeah. can see where I live. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. And then on a nice poignant note. Oh, oh no, no, no. I have two more. I have two more. Two more. Poet. Wait, can I change my answer about my favorite poet? Yes, you can. Okay. Yeah. I think my favorite answer, my favorite poet is Angela Jackson, the new poet laureate of Illinois, who is amazing. And she was just named the poet laureate like two weeks ago. Congratulations, I, Angela she's Jackson. She's a rough writer in Chicago. Angela S. Jackson. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. Your favorite kid's book that's not a graphic novel that you were involved with. Oh, my favorite kid's book? Oh, my God. There's like 10,000. The Secret Garden, The Last Unicorn. Um, oh, we've been reading The the um, Golden Compass. I'm going to oh, say Oh, my God. His Dark Materials. It's oh, amazing. my God. So yeah, I read the whole thing to my 10-year-old. We read all three books. Out well, loud. I'm so glad that you said that because, um, and she's not on Facebook, so I can say it, but I bought the trilogy for my niece, Grace, and oh, I yeah. bought it like- It's amazing. Three That's years ago. She's 10 now, and I was like, this is the year. This is the year for Lyra. So. Although I did read a great kid's book called The, uh, the Marrow Thieves, uh, which is a young adult book. 
Awesome. Yeah, his dark materials, amazing, amazing, amazing. Okay, and um, okay, this is the last one. Your wish, your wish for 2021. Well, if I could have a wish that would happen right now, I would get rid of ICE and I would make everybody who wants to be in this country immediately legal and citizens and I would tear down that stupid wall and all the barriers to letting people come into this country. That would be my wish. That's the first thing that comes to mind. That's a very good wish. And I think behind it is healthcare. <laughs> yeah. See, and, and I and I, I would be torn and tied on that one. The healthcare thing is massive. Our healthcare system, hey, but you know, that's a topic for another time. Yeah. And we're gonna leave it on a positive note. We are. And if I could play the 10,000 maniacs, um, yeah, let's 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 bring in our special guests. Yeah. Yoda, da 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 willow, da 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 and oops, and last but not least, okay. I'll see you on word count. Let's up our count. We'll see you on word count. And everybody out there, you know, thank you. We have a friendly competition. And thank you for joining. Thank you for supporting the humanities. Thank you actually just for listening to this conversation because I feel like I should have been taking notes. And when I get done, I'm going to listen to this and I'm going to jot down some notes. I've got to read some Angela Jackson. I've got to, there's a bunch of research that I need to do. No small plans, all this stuff. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you Ryan for joining us. And thank you for joining us at the last episode of Mimi's Global Cafe for 2020. Yeah. 2020, thank you so much for being such a bizarre year. Bye, 2020. See ya. Bye. Full Bye. 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 Thank you and good night.